Catherine O'Neill, and welcome to this edition of All About Boston. And we are delighted to be here tonight inter interviewing two candidates for special state representative elections on March 4th. Remember, if you're a registered voter in Dorchester, District 13, to vote next two Tuesdays, March 4th, in Charlestown. Our second guest will be Dan Ryan from Charlestown, running for the second Suffolk district seat. And our first guest is a friend of mine from Dorchester running for the 13th Suffolk seat, and he is John O'Toole, and welcome, John. Thank you, Kevin. To all of our Boston. It's great to be here again. I must mention, the first, I had you on, how many years ago was that? I'm like that, I probably can't oh, remember. Oh, I know, <laughs> huh? You and John O'Toole at uh, the John time. Tobin. Yeah. John Tobin, yes, I'm sorry. Right. Debated residency. Yes, it was, a, it was a lively debate, and uh, John, it was a, probably, it, it was a great show. It was a good it show. It was one of my it, most talked about <laughs> shows. It was, you were for residency and he was against yes, it, right? Yes, that's correct. It was a great show. Well, listen, you have a lot going on. You just turned 50. Yes. Happy birthday. Thanks I for reminding me. Yeah, I can say that to a guy. It doesn't matter. Um, and you're running for state representative. Yes. Now, if you're from Dorchester, people know who you are. Yeah. You have a stake in our community. Mm -hmm. You were the... Um, president of the Cedar Grove Civic for 14 yes. years. Your right. accomplishments, mm -hmm. uh, you really have a lot of accomplishments, John. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I mean, you really do. It, mm -hmm. It's not something that we can uh, skirt around. <laughs> you have done a lot in our community. Yeah. Thank you. When people go to Pope John Paul Park, they have you to thank for some of those efforts. Mm -hmm. So now you're running in a field of five. Correct. Five wonderful candidates. Yes. Good men, not a woman amongst them, but good five wonderful men, and you have your work cut out for you. You have 14 days left. So this 25 minutes is about you, and what are you doing specifically mm -hmm. to get your vote out on March 4th? T tell us about... Well, right now, it's, it's, it's fast and furious. This is, this is like a six-month campaign compressed into a period of about eight weeks. So the, the, the challenge really is, is to, to organize, uh, idea vote, get out there, literature, social media, all those things that typically you do over the span of, of eight months, six months, and get it into eight, eight weeks. So well, one of the advantages, advantages that I think that we have is that we, we've done this before. Um, you know, I had my race two and a half years ago for city council, and you know, we had a team that was ready to go. You know, we participated in the last special and election. And that race for city council, in case mm -hmm. some of the folks that are watching this aren't familiar with it, you ran with the field of Frank Baker, and Frank is yes. now the city councilor from District 3. Yes, doing a great job. And that was a close race. Yes. How many votes separated you guys? Uh, no, exactly. it was, he had a good, he had a, I think it was about 1,000 votes that okay. he had in that. So, but it was, it was a spirited race. It was a long race. It was, it, was, it was almost like nine months, I think, that entire race was. And, of course, we had a primary in that race. So and you've it, dug up the ground, actually, yes, yep, two yep, years ago. Yep, yep. So we, you know, we were familiar um, with, the, with the district. It, it's pretty close to District 3. Uh, it's not that much different. Um, you know, in, we've, we have a lot of our ID votes from the last election. You know, and with my history in the civic community, uh, participation in politics, you know, labor, you know, like you just mentioned, you know, we're, our, our na name recognition is, is pretty good in the district and we're happy with the, you know, the progress that we're making. But, you know, Dorchester's a forever changing place, you know, and we're finding that, you know, there's always new people coming in and, uh, you know, you have to go find those folks. And what we're finding is this, it's, it's at the doors, Catherine. You know, nobody answers their phone anymore. You know, they don't. Right. They see it. They, it's blocked ID. So you, what you really have to do is you have to go on those doors. You have to press the flesh. You have to meet them individually. You get to hear the concerns. And there's a lot of dialogue at the doors, it, it, in spite of the fact that it's been single digit. You know, it's the coldest winter ever. It's crazy. Today's it's like crazy. spring, you know, yeah. because I think it hit 28. But it, you know, we had single digit nights. But you have to do it. There's just no alternative to doing it because it, it's the only way to get in touch with the voter. I must say, now I was on a special election the exact same time last year. Mm -hmm. It was right around St. Patrick's Day. And it was Senator Linda Dorsey Nefori's mm -hmm. race. And we went into Keystone, just like you went into mm -hmm. Keystone. 
But when we went into Keystone last year, we didn't do what you did. You took in Irish step dancers. I was like, when I saw that, I said, I cannot believe that we did not think about that. Now, that was brilliant. Well, you know, you know, back, you know, we go way back, and, and me and my friend Pat McDonough used to do the Mac Tools events, and we always, it was always a show. We always had to, uh, you know, spice it up. So what we did is we're going into, and all the candidates are going into Keystone, so you have to come in with something different because you got to earn the senior vote, you know, and you have to it have it. It was brilliant. Right so that. we had a little pre St. Patrick's Day celebration. We brought in uh, my nieces and some other girls from uh, from the Irish dancing school, and we had uh, I had bought a lot of Irish trinkets and gifts for the seniors, and we had some raffles, we had some dancing, we had some music, and uh, and they told us it was the best event that they had had there in a long time. Well, good for you. Yeah. I thought to yeah. myself, now why didn't we think about that? <laughs> so now, when you talk about some of our folks might not know this, some of our viewers, but when you talk about the doors, mm -hmm. what you actually do and you've been about the business of doing, like mm -hmm. all of the other five candidates, is you have a list, mm -hmm. you know a good voter, and you knock on their door. Yep, yep. Well, we have uh, this very good information from the last mayoral election, so that's very fresh. That's just from November. So that, we're overlaying that with our old list, you know, in, in, in sifting through that, and, and you have to go to the doors. And, 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 you know, we're knocking on the doors and, and IDing that way and then, you know, putting back into the database. And basically, for a special election, the turnout's generally lower. So you really want to identify that super voter, you know, that, that person that's going to come up no matter what. So uh, getting to that person, um, we're finding certain areas. It's a very diverse district. I mean, it, it's, it's arguably the most diverse district in, in the city, I'd say. And, you know, we have great support in, in my home base. I have great support in the African-American community, the, the Asian-American community, and the Cape Verdean community up by the Bowdoin Geneva area. You have a lot of public safety support, too, John. Let's talk about about, mm -hmm. before you came in here, you were uh, endorsed by whom? Well, um, I, I had about 10 of the major labor unions that endorsed me, the plumbers, the pipe fitters, the pipe coverers, the carpenters, um, the Carmen's Union, um, a, a few others as well. Um, and most recently, I had the support of the uh, MBTA police. And tonight, I'll break to you that I, I, I actually got the endorsement of the, of, the, of the Boston uh, Police Patrolmen's Association of which uh, I was very happy to receive. And I, and I think that between the two public safety, you know, the T police and the Boston police, I think what it speaks to is, you know, I, I have a pre-existing relationship with, with both those agencies through my civic participation. And you know this, Catherine, is that, you know, in this district, there's six T stations from North Quincy, Ashmont, Charmett, Fields Corner, Seven Hill, and JFK. Um, taking the commuter rail and the safety issues that surround that, you know, it's critical to folks. You, right. you know, either whether you take it to work or, or just commute in town, whatever you're doing. And you know, there has been a spike in violence in the city since since January, and the mayor's doing a fantastic job of getting in front of that. The the T is expanding its hours uh, to 3 a.m. and there's no public safety plan at all at all for that with the T police, uh, with not the T, with the T itself. So the T police want to get in front of and say, you know, how are we going to staff this? Uh, we're going to work in conjunction with the Boston police uh, because let's face it, those hours are, are kind of the witching hours when you never, you know, where, where more incidents happen. Right. And uh, people have to feel safe riding the T. I support the extended hours, but there has to be a good uh, public safety uh, plan. So you're also a small business owner, correct? Yes. Talk about how important small business is to our neighborhood. Uh, as the owner of a small business, and I'm also a board member of the Dorchester Board of Trade, you know, it, it's a real challenge for small businesses to, you know, to, to make a living. You know, this, in some cases, there's an awful lot of regulations and, and uh, you know, the challenge of, of running a small business. You know, and I think I can bring that understanding to the State House, you know, and, and just hope that, you know, that they can, we need small businesses in the city. Boston's a thriving place, but I do hear it, you know, from small businesses, the, the permitting, the zoning processes, uh, uh, it, sometimes it takes too long. You know, I mean, we, we've had uh, in, in the neighborhoods like a simple use to, to get approved can sometimes take nine months. You know, and and sometimes the the owner that wants to open a small business has to carry that cost. You know, because uh, if they take the lease, the 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 owner of the property wants them to sign a lease. It, it's up to the person doing that. The, the business to get approvals in that period of time, it, it can croak you. So I'd like to streamline, I'd, you know, that's more of a city issue, but I'd like to see that kind of streamlined. And, and uh, that's one of the things I guess I've done before, even with the Vietnamese community, with the language barriers, you know, I've worked with uh, Vietnamese businesses, Vietnamese attorneys to help them kind of navigate those services between the city and the state. Now, I was with my mother today at uh, Mass General all day. She's 93. Sure. <clears throat> and um, I just think that our seniors are not respected like they should be. No. T tell me what you think about um, 
because Dorchester has the most senior citizens than any part of the city of Boston. How can you help them as a state representative? Well, once again, this kind of goes back to, you know, pre-existing relationships, doing things before. At the, at the civic level, Catherine, you know, what I found at Cedar Grove is, you know, seniors, would, we'd be almost like the first line of constituent services right. a, a, as a civic, you know, a president. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, you're in training to find these, it's particularly seniors. Seniors want to be able to stay in their homes as long as possible. And they should be able to do it. And they should be able to get the resources to do so, whether it's, you know, fuel assistance, meals on wheels. You know, my background was construction as well. And I've worked with, you know, Capitan's Local 67 uh, with Christmas in April, rebuilding together. And we used to go into these homes to help them, you know, make them handicap accessible, make the kitchens accessible, and most importantly, make their bathrooms accessible so they can use the tubs and the showers and everything else. So, um, you know, I'm a big advocate for that. And, and also in the campaign over the years that I've been in, you know, whether it's be St. Joseph's or, or the assisted living, is um, funding has remained pretty flat right. uh, for all those places. And, and I've, I've talked to the administrators of those places in the Lake Trump. We have not seen an increase in, in funding in eight to ten years. In fact, we've seen cuts. And um, what it's resulting is is lower quality care because, you know, nothing else, everything else is going up. Their, their overhead is going up, staffing is going up, insurance, uh, everything else. So I think we need to see, you know, some sort of adjustment for that because, you know, once again, you know, they're the veterans that defended this country. They're right. the people that raised the families here and built this country, and they deserve all the support and, and all the respect. Now, you you have a lot of serious issues that you always um, mm -hmm. talk about and, and help our community with, but you have a lot of fun things that yes. you do too, yeah. right? Yes. And one of the fun things, we have a little clip from 2005 that I shot when I was the um, crazy <laughs> camera woman, <laughs> and it was the rally that yes. you had and are we seeing that now? No. It was the rally that you ran for Governor Patrick. Yes. It, well, it was, was actually it for everybody. It was the gubernatorial, gubernatorial cycle that we did. The, and uh, there you are. Yep. Giving everybody orders. You <laughs> haven't changed. That is so not fair. <laughs> Councilor Feeney is in that shot. Um, yep. That is terribly not fair that you look the I, exact same. Was that 2005 or 2001? It, 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 it's probably on my shirt there. That's the... Uh, that's from a golf tournament, but uh, you did a 2001 rally yeah, too. We, uh, right? Yeah, I did three. Uh, it uh, was over the, the years. day before 9/11. Yes, that was. I think that was the day before 9/11. That, that probably was, and that was, um, and that was one of the things because you know, you know, you and I growing up in Dorchester that. Uh, Politics is sport yeah, here, yeah, and take yeah. it very seriously. And you know that we had the rally in Adams Village, you know, to to elevate the political dialogue, to elevate candidates. And if you remember, uh, that Congressman Steve Lynch had that dr dramatic, it was cr yeah, dramatic that was labor that, yeah, march yeah, yeah, coming yeah, yeah, down yeah. the hill, and that was a tight race. Uh, Cheryl Shakes was was right behind yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Congressman Lynch, and uh, I like to think that the, that little coordinated march down the hill was covered by all the news stations. And, I have uh, all of that on yeah, tape. Yeah, 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 I'd love to see that yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I should uh, do that. It was a lot of fun, you know, and, and and it's still like that in Dorchester. You know, I'd like to see to do the rally again. Uh, we haven't a, done one, right? No, we uh, no no. I, I uh, I'd like to do it again. It would be fun to do again. So it's a lot of work. Would be for 2014, right? Yeah, now would be the yeah, 2014. Yeah. Maybe we can. Uh, Maybe we can do it. And it costs a lot of money. It costs too, a lot right? of money too. It's a, it's an awful lot of work. The logistics of it are huge, and, and and even now, if you think about it now, the security issues would be huge too. So. Um, it was always a grassroots thing that we did in the neighborhood. You know, labor often helped a lot, like the cop and this, and all those guys would dedicate their time to get the staging up. And, you know, some of the merchants would participate as well. And uh, I'd like to do it again. 2014 would be a, a, a great time to do it. It seems mm -hmm. that people are walking away from the state house. Mm -hmm. It seems that a lot of elected officials are leaving, and yet, yet you're walking towards it. Tell me how you got to that decision, because it is, people don't get it. It's 24-7, mm -hmm. all the time. Tell me how you got there. A lapse of sanity? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, actually, uh, you know, I, I have three boys at home. Well, you're crazy. That's yeah, why yeah, I yeah, like Yeah, yeah, so, uh, and... Uh, three my, very handsome young boys, by you. the way. They're not young anymore, no, though, I No, no, but my, you uh, you know, my oldest son, Jack, is at Boston Latin, and uh, he's joining the Marines in July, and I'm very proud of him, and uh, he's done very well at Latin. And uh, so he'll be gone in July. And my son Ron is at Roxbury Latin, and he'll be off to college in a year. And Daniel's at, 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 and going into high school next year. So for me personally, you know, that was my biggest concern. And you know, I want to make sure that it's manageable, and it is. You know, I talked to them, and, and they're encouraging me to do it. And, and, and it's a good time in my life, Catherine, to do it. You know, you know, one of the things I think that makes me 
qualified as well is, is life experiences. You know what I mean? The, the, the role of a representative is just that, representative. So you're representative of the district. And, you know, Dorchester has been my passion. I live, breathe it, bleed yeah, it. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's everything to yeah. me. And I think I can take that to, up to the hill and uh, and just bring some of that. And, and it, it's important that people be heard. You know, there's, there's a lot of issues, Kathy. You know, we have you know, a lot of people in uh, our neighborhood that are living on the cusp. I, yeah, you know, yeah. and it, we have a lot of state issues these mm -hmm. days, and I don't want to trash the Patrick administration, but we have a uh, situation with that young boy mm -hmm. that nobody knows where he is. Yeah. We have medical marijuana now that is mm -hmm. landed on our doorstep. How, you know, these issues affect people in our neighborhood. The unemployment website. People aren't getting paid. Tell, tell me how you would help us. There, there's a lot of issues that are kind of like the elephant in the room that people just don't talk about. And, and once again, on the doors, you, you know, you, you hear it from folks that you know that uh, you know they've been out of work for an awful long time. I, I had a a couple on my own street, you know, and, and they're in, they're in the later 50s, and uh, he got laid off, but then he got a job, and so then they had their they got their insurance back, so they were thrilled. I saw her a week later, they cut his hours back to 29 hours, so he was no longer qualified to get insurance. So now they have no insurance. And, you know, there, there has to be a better way, you know. Um, and, and we really, you know, I'm about common sense, practical approaches to things. Uh, you, know, you know, funding these things is always the issue, you know, and, and people, you know, there's an awful lot, people taxed a lot as it is. So, you know, but I would like to bring, you know, the, those experiences that I have and, and what I'm hearing from folks on the street and, and, uh, and bringing it up to the hill, you know, and just, like I said, Dorchester is very, you know, blue collar. Right. Uh, you know, people have real life issues there and I, I think that uh, they need to hear it up in the hill. And when you get laid off when you're 50 mm -hmm. to 65, it's so hard to get a job again. You know, Catherine, once again, I, th I think it's, it's, it's one of these things that uh, it, it's, it's going to become more apparent as time goes by. The but I have, I have friends that have been out of work for an awful long time, you know, folks with degrees and, you know, that had very good jobs and thought they were going to be re-entering the workplace. But they're up against, you know, some very young people that have come right out of college that can work for a lot less. And uh, it's, it's tough, you know. And what did you think about, not to interrupt you, but we, before we run out of time, <laughs> What did you think about the Boston Globe putting up the trial balloon that they're going to sell their property? I could see that coming because I have family that works there in the printing department, and they've been printing the Globe in Bill Ricker for years now. Right. So th that massive plant is really no longer necessary. And let's face it, that's that's an amazing piece of real estate there, six acres, you know, right on Marisu Boulevard. It's the biggest asset that the Globe actually owns. So I think for them to remain competitive, to remain relevant, and let's face it, the, the printed paper is is kind of going the way of the dinosaur and everything's going online I think it's something they have to do um, but I, I would want to be sure that there's a lot of dialogue with the community that's most affected by by that location um, you know it, it's a superb location I mean there's so right. much going on there now with UMass and, and Boston College You've done a, an amazing addition right. there it's close to the T it's close to the expressway um, you know these are the things that you and I have known about years Dorchester is a great place right, you know right, right. And, and, uh, and now people are starting to realize it, and they're coming here and uh, you know now like it, who knows what's going to go there, but the, it's, it's six acres. That's all. That's probably the largest parcel uh, of land available in in the city, maybe. Yeah. So we have to be very careful with mm -hmm. um, what does go there because yeah. it affects our lives. It affects it very, yeah. 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 You know the density, the uses. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it'd be it'd be great to see something there that the the whole community can agree on. It's an asset to Dorchester as well. And it would be transit oriented development, yeah, right? Yeah, because yeah. of its Which access. tends to give you more units, right. you know, more height. It kind of lets you get around a lot of zoning issues. So, but, uh, um, so we have to be really vigilant about that. And there seems to be a resurgence in folks paying attention to a blight in our community that we've known about for years, and that's the drug and alcohol drug problem, and, yeah. right? And I know that uh, you've been on the forefront of that, organizing meetings. Mm -hmm. So. Tell me what your thoughts are now that everybody's paying attention to it again. Well, you know, that case is near and dear to me and, you know, families and friends and, 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 and you know, people need help. And then, once again, kind of a silent epidemic of sorts because people don't necessarily want to talk about it. But, uh, you know, the heroin is brutal and, and uh, you know, alcohol, drugs, it, it, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. And, you know, and, and once again, in the 
role that I've done in the community, you know, when you find somebody that wants to get help, you know, I can't tell you how many times that you, you get somebody to that point where they're actually willing to check in. There's no beds. Right. You know, you're on the phone Particularly calling. Particularly for women, too. That yeah. obvi definitely, the, definitely hardest for women. And, and, you know, getting on the phone, you know, like you said, that window of opportunity is small to get them to go. And, and, and if you don't have a bed, it's tough. And uh, then they either go into holding or wait for a bed. You know, this should be something, when somebody's willing and ready to get help, there should be a bed available for them. And uh, that's something that definitely needs more funding, too. When you think about running for um, the 13th Suffolk mm -hmm. seat, what are your thoughts about, it's such a powerful legacy in that seat, <laughs> right? Is. So you have Representative Marty Walsh, who is now Mayor Walsh. Mm -hmm. You had Jim Brett before him. Mm -hmm. And who before him? Um, oh, yeah. Well, that's going back 30 years now between the two of them. Yeah, so, yeah. But it's a, it's a seat that has just such promise. I mean, you, you go to a next place. Yeah. Did, did you think about that at all before you jumped in or um, a day at a time? They are big shoes to yeah. fill, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I gave that a lot of thought as well. And, you know, would I be able to serve well? And, and, and I think I could, you know, I think I bring a, kind of a lifetime of experience to the job. The big shoes to fill. I mean, Marty did an incredible job and, you know, I would certainly turn to him for advice and, you know, uh, and how to do the job. But um, I think of all the candidates, I think once again, you know, life experiences, uh, you know, doing, I, I think I'm probably most able to hit the ground running. You know, I, I have the community's uh, You feel experience. like you could go to the State House and start day one, right? Is that yeah, how you I, feel? Yeah, with an awful lot to learn, yeah, of course, yeah. but I, I think that, uh, you know, between my community service, political, you know, I have a background in labor as well, and, and, and you know, and bringing that to the House, uh, I, you know, I, I think I could find my way around up there. If elected, what's the first thing that you'd like to concentrate on? Well, there's a lot of issues. You know, um, one of the things I worked on years ago, you know, when my son, uh, when my oldest son was actually entering into kindergarten, um, this is more of a city issue, but, you know, education, obviously, because, you, you know, Catherine, our age group, as we were getting older, when people were having kids, they, uh, left. they left because there was no educational opportunity. So when my son Jack was uh, enrolling into K K1, um, the fourth generation Bostonian, he was unassigned anywhere in the city of Boston. I mean, nowhere. So um, I had to send her to Quincy to a private school. Uh, you know, I took the city. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 took, uh, I took the city and the Department of Education to federal court in a three-year landmark case. And we were on our way to the uh, Supreme Court. The assignment policy was archaic. It, at that time, it was a 30-year-old po policy. So you took them to court all by yourself? John O'Toole, yep. yep. It, with the really? help of my friend Ann Walsh. And, uh, and uh, we went up there and we fought it. And uh, we had Nancy Gertner was the judge. And she, she ended up leaving the case. We got Donald Stern. Uh, we had a solid case, but we, you know, a lot of resources. This is just a private, uh, Chester Dowling was helping us, you know, the civil rights attorney. Okay, I remember yep, that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, And uh, we were on our way to the Supreme Court, which probably would have set a precedent nationwide. The city kind of backed down a little bit. You know, it opened the dialogue about a subject that nobody wanted to talk about, you know. And, and, and what we did is we got closer to neighborhood schools. We got some advanced work programs. We got continuity in the schools, you know, years later through, like, the K through 12s because, the education system was like a, K, a kindergarten system, elementary, and then a middle school somewhere else, and a high school somewhere else. So we were losing kids you know, in between. You could be at a great elementary school, end up in a horrible middle school, and then these kids weren't graduating. So now we're seeing like um, the Henderson is now a K through 12. It's wonderful. They're joining with the Woodrow Wilson. So these kids, if you could get your kid into the, into the school kindergarten, they could actually graduate high school. I mean, how, how great is that? Uh, it, but there's still a lot of work to be done, you know. Um, so education would be a uh, thing. P public safety, like we talked about, you know, substance abuse, alcohol, crime. Um, I was at the Greater Love Tabernacle three weeks ago for the interface service. You, you might have saw it. I mean, it was an, an amazing uh, event of music, song, recovery, redemption. That, yeah. It was amazing. So I left there at the top of the world. And that was at one end of Talbot Ave. And as we drove to the other end of Talbot Ave at Peabody Square, there was a shooting right in the Tedeschi's. And that's, that's the house that I first owned when, you know, when I, uh, first house that I bought as an adult. And uh, a young man was shot in the head. It was a gang-related uh, shooting. So, you know, it's like a tale of two cities. You know, there's so much work to be done. These, these kids, it has to be early intervention. These kids have to realize that they have more options than, than the gang life more options than drugs and, and alcohol. So, you know, you got to get in front of them early, and uh, I think you can save a lot of lives. And, and Emmett does great work at the Dorchester Youth Collaborative. Yes, he really yeah. does, yeah. He yeah. really does. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I would look to someone like him for, you know, working on a, a, a good program to, you know, to implement for that. So, okay, I'm going to give you two minutes. 
you look in that camera and you tell everybody <laughs> in the 13th Suffolk District why they ought to vote for you. Thank you, Captain. You're and welcome. Uh, always have a great time on your well, show. Well, it's always Thank a you. pleasure to have yeah. you. Uh, my name is John O'Toole, a uh, lifelong resident of Dorchester, and uh, I have 25 years of uh, civic participation, uh, political participation, uh, raising my family here, and I would love the opportunity to represent you in the 13th Suffolk District. The election's on March 4th, which is less than two weeks away. I'd be honored and privileged to have you vote, and I would give 110% of my efforts towards the job. And um, the election, once again, March 4th, both for John O'Toole and Catherine, thanks so much. You always have such a great time on your show. John, you know what I didn't ask you? Your website. Let's give your website so people can visit your website. Uh, it's, it's O'Toole for Rep at gmail.com. Say email, O'Toole for Rep at gmail.com. Gmail yes. So if anybody wants to get with John, all they have to do is email him. Yes. How many days are left? Uh, tomorrow, 11. 11 days. Yep. Well, we wish you the best of Thank luck. You, Catherine. You're with a great team of people running for this seat. Yes. Dorchester is the victor here, no matter what happens. Yep. And it's all Dorchester, right? Virtually. Oh, Quincy. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And a portion of Quincy. Yeah, that's we can't right. There's a small portion in Quincy, right. Uh, right in North Quincy. How did that happen? Re that's redistricting. redistricting. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. We'll be right back with Dan Ryan, a candidate for state representative in the second Suffolk. We'll be right back. Hello, Catherine O'Neill. We're back on All About Boston. We're getting our sea legs. And now we're with Dan Ryan, a candidate for the second Suffolk District, Charlestown in Chelsea. Dan, Catherine. welcome to All About Boston. Well, thank you. For Delighted to have you. Yeah. We've been a long time, long sure. time friends. Yeah. Tell me how it's going. It feels, it feels great. Uh, you know, it was uh, probably the coldest winter we've had. It's in, crazy. In, as long as I can remember. Um, but, uh, you know, we're out there now. The weather broke today, which was great. You know, it just feels good being able to walk down the street where people are out and about. Uh, but uh, besides that, we've been, doing, uh, we've been doing everything you do in an election, um, you know, knocking on doors as much as we can. Um, you know, when people look like they don't want to open the door after a while, we knock it off and do other things. <laughs> you get it. Um, yeah, I don't mind being in the cold. There's people paying high heating bills in New England right. that they don't want to let the heat out. Uh, but we've been able to adapt our strategy a little bit. In, in, uh, we've set up a series of little meet and greets and, and discussions uh, in different restaurants and, and coffee shops around uh, town in Charleston and in Chelsea. And uh, we're bringing people out to us. And uh, I just left a room of... Uh, 50 to 100 people back in Charleston. They're still there. I think I have to go back in a little while. But uh, it's been doing, doing great. Two or three of those in, uh, a week and just talking to people about the issues and, and why it's important. Now, Charlestown is the oldest neighborhood in the city of Boston. Yes. And for the longest time, I think since 1976, correct me if the year is not right, you haven't, Charlestown has not had an elected official mm -hmm. of its own. Um, yeah. Gino Flaherty. Mm-hmm. Was he? He's from Medford, he's from, and uh, then he... Chelsea, primarily from Chelsea. Okay. When he ran for office, he was from Chelsea. I think he grew up mostly in Chelsea. Okay. Uh, his family lived in Medford, but his dad worked in Chelsea. So, uh, you know, I think he's a Chelsea kid at heart. Uh, it's funny, people uh, from further outside of the city, on the other side of the city, when they hear that Charleston hasn't had its own elected official for that long, right away they say, what about Gino Flaherty? Because right. he well, just, you know, he kind of fits the old mold. Uh, you know, and, he, and he's been good to Charleston. Huh? And, uh, you know, so no, we haven't had, I believe it was 78. Um, 78. We lost the seat, and in 79, Richie Volk, I believe, took office in okay. 79. And that was Jim Collins. Jim right? Collins. And he had won the seat when uh, Dennis Kearney, uh, former sheriff, um, was at an event for me the other night. And it was 40 years ago this week that he won the seat to represent Charleston from East Boston. So it was... Uh, crazy. It was uh, in East Boston, part of East Boston seat, and then uh, a Charleston seat. Then a couple of different things happened. I'm not sure exactly of the history, but uh, somewhere in there, they cut the number of representatives in the state legislature, right. and I believe in half. So Charleston got redistricted. That's, I think, when Dennis came in, and then he also left to, to become the sheriff. He was appointed, I believe, sheriff, and that's what opened the seat. Jimmy Collins won that election. And then that's when Charleston got redistricted after Jimmy had won the election. So lots of folks in Charlestown think you're due for your own guy, we do. right? We do, yeah. Now you have, I had uh, Roy on last week, and I did mm -hmm. a little um, research on mm -hmm. Chelsea. And it's a very, your district, if you win, that you will represent, 
it's from one end to the other. It's very, very high-end folks mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. Charlestown. And then very, yeah. when I say high-end, I mean economic. Sure, And then Absolutely. you have yeah. people on the cusp of poverty in Charlestown mm -hmm. and also in Chelsea. In Chelsea. So the income disparity issue has become the overriding issue for me anyway. You know, we go on this series of these interviews with the labor unions and the different groups. Uh, special interest groups, and that's one of the things they ask you, well, what are the issue that most concerns you? And at first, you know, I started out, this was a special election, so I wasn't exactly sure. Right. And the more I look at it, income disparity is the n number one overarching crazy, issue. You, you can't really adjust, uh, address any of the other issues until you address that one. Um, we have I, to get people back to the middle class. Dan. Exactly. And, and that's, um, in this district, I believe this district probably would be, and I've been kind of saying this without really having had the oppor opportunity to do the research on it, but it, it, it has to be the, uh, the district in the Commonwealth with the most income disparity. Uh, there's probably a couple of others that are close, but you know, Chelsea, for the city its size, is, is the median incomes, I think, about 35 to 40,000. Then, you know, there's also residents over there living there who, who don't show up in the statistics. Charleston, you know, depending on what statistics you use, has the second highest median income in the entire city. 89,000, yeah. I think. And, uh, now, and that's also with uh, a housing stock that's yeah, about 40 to 45 percent subsidized, too. We right. have a lot of elderly housing there. We have a lot of different subsidized housing. The largest public housing project in New England is the Bunker Hill Housing Development. Um, so a lot it, of folks in Charlestown, which was pointed out to me last week, have a lot in common with folks in Chelsea. It, yes. Right? It, it, oh, do, oh, do they ever? Yeah. And, um, and they have family over in Chelsea, and uh, they've introduced me to a lot of their family, yeah. which is a very good thing. Um, and, 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 you know, a lot of those issues cross the river. It's not, you know. Yeah. Um, in Charlestown went through the gentrification, you know, 20 years ago. So, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, the orange line went by my bedroom window until I was about eight years old. I tell people that's why I have a little... Problem paying Stop attention it, sometimes, right. but I can't hear. but uh, you know that's it. but that is issues that that people talk about now the environmental right. impacts of, of 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 industry and things, and uh, you know Chelsea's on the on the cusp of, of I think being the next great city to turn around and, and gentrify. It's so close to Boston. Right. There's water access there that you know we did they've something. They've come a long way. Right? This, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they've you know, but it's it's you know it's been a waterfront community, an immigrant community, and and. You know, the, the trick then becomes when a, a population becomes upwardly mobile, if there's not a housing stock there, a good housing stock there, they have to move out. And we, we, we've experienced that in, in the housing right. projects in Charleston. I talked to uh, Latino families in the housing projects that have been there 23 years. You know, one, one woman who's a dear friend of mine and helping me out. She raised two sons in the Bunker Hill housing projects. They're from the Dominican Republic. Both sons went on and graduated to, from college, but they had to move out. They, they, you know, they they didn't stay in Charleston because there was no, no housing for that upwardly mobile family, whether it be immigrants or, right. or you know, ch you know, Charleston, a traditional what people would consider ch traditional Charleston. Like our former yeah. guest John O'Toole, mm -hmm. uh, you have worked in your community your whole life. You, yes. ha you have experience with the federal level. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Now, yeah. so tell our audience who don't know you. So, so one of the things that people uh, in Chelsea particularly, because I've represented Chelsea for Congressman Capuano for 10 years. So My I, second I, favorite congressman. <laughs> okay. Um, so you know, a few people, my first, uh, when I first started talking to them, they were like, well, how come we don't see more of you? And one of the things I tell them, the area I represent for Congressman Capuano as a liaison is bigger than a state senate district. And what I try to tell them is, you know, when, when I get this job, or hopefully I get your job, this job with the, your help, you know, I tell them I will only be representing Charleston and Chelsea. It's about a fifth of what I do now. Um, I'll be more hands-on. You know, so on the federal government level, and, you know, they're starting to bring the silver line into Chelsea now. They've already paved the road where the silver line is going to go. Uh, last year, I believe, we cut the ribbon, or the congressman helped cut the ribbon on the Meridian Street Bridge. And they, you know, they widened the channel so that heating oil tankers could get up the channel. And I try to tell people, I worked on that stuff when I lived in Washington, D.C. 14 years ago. 
You know, that's how right. long it takes, you know, major projects like that to, to, you know, come through the system and down into the federal, state, and city level. So I have that experience on, on, on you know, how these big projects get started. And, you know, with the federal experience and other regional relationships that I have, I feel I'm going to be able to finish a lot of these major infrastructure pro, uh, projects that we have going on. The big dig, you know, came to an end, but that doesn't mean all the roads and bridges that lead to it are fixed. There are a lot of uh, traffic issues in Charlestown, and with the mm -hmm. casinos, 56% mm -hmm. of the traffic is going to go right through Charlestown. So tell, mm -hmm. are people talking to you about that when you're knocking doors? Yeah, or? so, so if, it feels like everybody brings up the casino, um, it, it, but for a lot of them, I think they bring it up because they feel like they have to. It, it's, it's the forefront issue. And then when you talk more in depth of, with people about it, you know, th there is a segment of the population that is just morally opposed to casinos or they just don't like them no matter where they are or, or, or they at least don't want them in Greater Boston, and that's fine. Uh, and then most other people have different, they're in different levels of, of, of where they're at on it. Um, but the biggest thing is not, I find, it's not that people are afraid, you know, they bring up the crime and, and, and everything else and the gambling, that is a concern, but most people are concerned about if it comes, where does it come, you know, where, wherever it comes, what's the infrastructure issues, what's the traffic impact, what's the environmental impact, you know, that, that's people's concerns more than the casino itself is what's the impact getting people to because and from. Because it's going to impact Charlestown. It's going to change. Some community in Greater Boston will be changed forever by a casino. Uh, the Chelsea, the Charlestown one, you know, will be. So I've also been telling people from, uh, the only homework I've done on this is through Google Maps, but I believe if I'm elected, there will not be an elected official in the Commonwealth that lives closer to one of the proposed casino sites than me. Okay. okay, my house is right off of route, my street leads to Rutherford Avenue, which is Route 99, which on the other end of that, over the Alpha Street Bridge, is the site for the casino. It's less than a mile from my house. Um, so, you know, I'm going to have a vested interest in what goes on there, you know. And, uh, you know, some of this is already, the ball was rolling before this election started. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I can stop the casino. Right. You know, I, I, I think that's an irresponsible way to... to Go about business. I say, I'm, I'm against it. I'm just going to stop it. It's like you know, I'm going to. It's coming. You know, pun I guess intended, but we got to deal with the cards that are dealt right now. Right. And you know, we're a little bit behind here. And I think we need somebody who's going to walk out the front door every day, knowing that at the other end of that road, from where I'm raising my family, there could be a casino. So you have Charlestown may have Charlestown and Chelsea may have a moment to. Get new infrastructure, new ballparks, new. Chelsea's right? in a position where they're going to be impacted by either one. Right. You know, they're in a place where they border both, if you consider East Boston still part of the East Boston Revere proposal, which, you know, I, I you know, by an aerial map, it really is. Um, oh, and they actually border Revere anyway. So Chelsea is a border community to both. They right. border Everett and they border Revere. So Chelsea's going to be impacted either way. Um, you know, Char I mean, Charleston will too, but we don't border East Boston and Revere the way Chelsea does. And because of your experience with the federal government and doing what you have done, you feel like you're ready to go the minute you get elected if you were to win? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the interesting part about the casino debate, because it's a state law, uh, unless we find out that there's a Native American tribe somewhere in one of these communities, there really is no federal uh, jurisdiction over that except for the, the, you're going to need the federal government for infrastructure improvements. There's no way around it. You know, I don't know exactly the formulas, but most of our major infrastructure is about 80% federal money. I don't know if that number is exactly right, but it, it, it's, it, you're going to need federal money to do this. Um, and I know exactly how that, that system works. I do some transportation work for the congressman, not all of it, but I understand the, the formulas that are used, or, or at least I know who to talk to to, to figure important. that out. Yeah. yeah. So this isn't your first time that you've run for office, correct? Correct. You ran for Boston City Council, right? 2006 with, uh, against uh, Sal and Matina in the final. There were some other candidates, and uh, Sal endorsed me two weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. Me and Sal remained friends, and were friends at the time. We were just both fighting for, uh, you know, a, a little piece for our neighborhoods. So, yeah, 
Yeah, in 2016. So do you think that's helping you in this race that you... Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That was a special election also. Um, and I spent a long time hemming and hawing, should I do this, should I not? Uh, when this special election jumped up, I knew one of the fatal flaws I made the last time was waiting too long to decide. Okay. Um, so this time it was, uh, you know, uh, it was there was an announcement during uh, Mayor Walsh's inauguration ceremonies that Gino Flaherty would be leaving. It became official about a day or two later, um, and I just made up my mind right, right away. So I talked to my you wife. Were out of the so gate we're doing right it. Away. Let's go. What has been your biggest? Is there a difference running for? City council and running for state rep? Yeah. What um, is it? Well, first of all, the geography is a lot different. Okay. Um, this is a very small, very close-knit district. It's very easy. I can go back and forth to Chelsea two or three times a day. Um, you forget it's that close when it's, you're it's, way it's over. It's very close. And, you know, East right? Boston and, and the North End, were, which was part of the city council district, that's pretty close, too. Yeah. But it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot bigger. You know, there was 14 precincts in East Boston, seven in Charlestown, right. and I forget in the North End, you know, how many, five, I think. Um, so it's definitely a lot bigger. Uh, and the issues are different. Uh, and, and the race itself is different. The, the, the city council race was a uh, municipal race, so that's considered a preliminary, not a primary. So regardless of party, the top two vote getters go on. Uh, so that means the the preliminary for that race was almost like a warm-up You know you're able to test your field operation And then if you come in the top two you get to go on to the final this one It's all or nothing on primary March day. 4th. March 4th. That's it. So it's uh, you know, there's no room forever So what do you you have how many days left? 11, 11 days left yeah. Are there exciting plans for the next 11 days? Or are you doing the same thing that you? It, it, you know, we're really trying to catch up um, in terms of, you know, there's a million ideas out there, and it's just every day that you try to sit down and plan them, you're just losing another yeah. day. So we have some good things planned. We're going to have a bunch of events to really motivate, um, really motivate our vote and get it out there. Uh, what kind of hours are you putting in, Dan? Like the last few days, th this will be a 13-hour day yeah. today. 13 hours outside the house, actually doing stuff. I'll probably go home tonight at 10 o'clock and catch up on some email and. Uh, um, and things like that, but a lot, a lot of it's fun stuff. You know, to, this is vacation week. I did take yesterday morning off. Took my uh, my girls to the children's museum. How many children do you have? Oh, I have. Yeah. Um, so I have two little girls, six and four, and sixteen-year-old son Meyer. He's in high school, so he's the six-year-old and the sixteen-year-old are off uh, this week. So that that's an interesting. I had them both with me today. Um, and how are they doing? Do they like it? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. They they door knocked with me the oh, whole great. bit. Yeah, we've we've done that in the past. And, Excellent. Uh, so we were able to spend some time campaigning today because you know some of the daytime stuff is fun stuff. We go to the elderly bingos. And, and it was warm today. And it was warm today. Thank yeah. goodness, yeah. right? So, I'm going to give you a minute to look into this camera and sure. tell everybody in your district why they should vote for you on March 4th. Yeah, uh, I know the district. I know it well. I have regional relationships that are going to help me, f you know, do the work and fight for Chelsea and Charleston um, and continue to build both communities. The, uh, in the direction they're going. I think both, you know, Charlestown um, has really turned around in my lifetime in the last 20 years, and I believe Chelsea's right on the cusp of doing the same. It's right, it, right next to downtown Boston, um, and we're, we're going to make this thing work for both communities. I'd love your vote on March 4th, special election. Dan Ryan, thank you. What's your website, Dan? DanRyanForRep.com. DanRyanForRep.com. And so if you want to get them, that's how you get them. DanRyanForRep.com. My name is Catherine O'Neill. I'd like to thank you for joining us on this edition of All About Boston. I'd like to thank the best cable access crew on the planet, the crew at BNN. And uh, we'll see you next week. We have three candidates next week. And I uh, look forward to seeing you then. Good job. Yeah. We out.